good evening everyone and uh, welcome to the 10th webinar organized by palawan learning systems in collaboration with center for escalation of peace and ritanjali uh, before we delve into today's webinar i would uh, like to say a few words about the three organizations that are involved in putting together this webinar uh, firstly palawan learning systems or pls is an educational research organization that primarily focuses on concepts of learning how to learn and believes in promoting learning in all the various facets and diverse forms one of the main objectives of pls is to conduct research and organize seminars and conferences such as the webinar that we are attending today um, and we do this for the creation and dissemination of new knowledge uh, what we do at pls remains current and relevant and uh, to the rapidly changing times and pls has conducted many webinars in the past and they've dealt with topics such as the future of learning nurturing our learners in the times of covid-19 developing a thriving community approach to promote learning the the relevance of formal education and do degrees matter and if you're interested in these webinars uh, topics we would like and you would like to learn more about them please do reach out to us and uh, we would be delighted to share the detailed reports on them um the other organization that is involved in organizing this webinar is cep or the center for escalation of peace and uh, cep seeks to create platforms and establish programs that lead to the free exchange of ideas across borders with a distinct focus on empowering young minds and cep takes the view that peace does not really refer to merely the absence of war and peace cannot be taken for granted or merely sustained instead peace needs to be escalated through these various strategies and platforms and cep's dialogues uh, and activities revolve around the three pillars of calmness which are youth and education trade and sustainable development and society and culture ritanjali is an organization uh, founded on the basis of respect for life work and dignity empowerment through holistic education and skilling and building community capacity and collective processes towards inclusive society uh, since 1995 ritanjali has worked with marginalized groups such as slum dwellers jail inmates poverty stricken individuals victims of war and national disasters and through education and development related endeavors is how the work goes forward today's webinar um as we can see and we've uh been looking at the poster that we had shared is a webinar on a is a part of a series of webinars which have been on a quest to learn and it's a series on evolving nature of one's learning journey and the theme of this webinar is the unseen revolution technology education and life and as you can see from the topic of the webinar itself it is quite broad it's it's technology education and life seems to cover a lot of different facets and seems to have a very large umbrella and to engulf that we have panelists and moderators that go into various areas of life um i'm pleased to introduce the moderators and the panelists and myself uh, starting with myself i am pujan sahil and i'm an educator who specializes in mathematics and i'm also a musician and i often integrate technology in both my personal and professional pursuits uh furthermore i've written articles which have been published in um various uh, newspaper dailies and online platforms and the articles have been on education art and technology and um i'm glad to be a part of this panel the moderator the the moderator for this webinar will be arman mathur arman is currently pursuing his political science honors from kirorimal college in the delhi university he is an avid reader and he writes since his school years he also started the student edition of hindustan times and he's been writing on diverse topics like india's domestic politics constitutional law world politics and culture and they've been published all across uh, places like the print india forum freedom gazette and etc uh, arman's passions lie in the field of history political science education technology and international relations um thank you so much arman for being here the panelist for today is also dr ani koshi dr ani koshi is the principal of st mary school and she has done her graduation and post graduation in english honors from lsr delhi um dr ani koshi has also done her ma in education management 
from uh, Oxford, UK. Um, Koshi ma'am received her PhD um, and she did her PhD from IIT Delhi and it was focused on the topic of discourse of education, which is re-examining the concept of inclusion via a study of narratives of school children and the Indian state. Thank you so much, Koshi ma'am, for being here. Another panelist that we have with us is Dr. Kavi Arya. Dr. Arya is a professor of computer science in and engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Bombay. He holds a BSc honors in computer science from the Imperial College of Technology in the UK and an MSc honors and PhD in computation from the University of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Arya has been a part of various um, esteemed panels. He's been uh, in the animation workstations group at the IBM's TJ Watson's research labs in uh, New York, USA. And prior to joining IIT Bombay, he held various positions in this industry. Dr. Arya is a member of high-level government committees on IT advisory boards and industry and serves on the government uh, or the governing counseling and academic councils of several universities. Thank you so much, Dr. Arya, to be a part of the panel. And um, before I hand over the floor to Arman and to start off the webinar and moderate it, uh, if you have any questions for the panel, please share them in the chat box feature of Zoom. And we will also try to get them answered during the Q&A session that we have by the end of the webinar. And general comments and observations are also welcome. I invite Arman Mathur to start the discussion on the topic and delve right into it, the important theme of the unseen revolution, technology, education, and life. Arman, over to you. Thank you so much, Poojan, for that very warm introduction. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Arman, and as you know, I will be moderating today's what's sure to be a very intriguing discussion. And um, before we move on to our panelists, allow me to provide an anchor to the conversation which we're going to have here on technology and what exactly we mean by this unseen revolution. We're in a rapidly changing world. Late last year, chat GPT took the world by storm. It can debate you. It's a chatbot which can debate you on Plato's organic society, solve complex mathematical problems, pen down a research essay, a wistful poem for a lover, or a sonnet on electric cars. Yes, it's quite an invention, but it's not the only one of its kind. You know, you had other companies coming out with uh, bots like DALI, which was a system which lets you create digital images simply by describing what you want to see. GPT-3. Uh, a natural language system that can write and code with brilliant fluency. And one of the most interesting, my personal favorite is one called Character AI, which creates bots that impersonate characters, historical characters, cultural, religious figures. And yes, you can speak to Jesus. And yes, he speaks a lot in Psalms. So this is uh, an inflection point, right? This is what the unseen revolution it is. I, I see it personally as a modern Pandora's box. They say Pandora got too curious and opened misery upon the world. Had she waited, she might have opened blessings and happiness. So our premise here today is precisely this. Have we too opened a Pandora's box? Have we given our learners access to a modicum of technology without giving them the right incentives to learn how to use it the right way? And how do we look at the learning environment at schools and colleges and consequently at learners and teachers who have now become consumers of this technology today? So the point is not only what's done inside institutions, but also what's done outside institutions, how this drastic, exciting and scary change is going to shape learners beyond institutions. That's the premise which I want to put to our panelists here today. So uh, let me begin with Professor Kavi. Professor Kavi, uh, you're an IIT professor. Uh, of course, you have a background in science and technology. What is your understanding of this unseen revolution? How is it changing learning according to you? And how has it shaped your learners? Over to you. The unseen revolution, I see it as just a continuum there's been a revolution since the industrial revolution and before also. This is just a continuing revolution. Uh, like for instance, we allowed computers to enter schools uh, a decade ago or more or whatever it is. People began to get empowered. The individual began to get more empowered with the technology and, what, and as soon as the World Wide Web came in the internet, they got even more empowered in the sense that they got access to information that they didn't have before. They could be far more creative in their, in their engagement with education. 
now what seems to be happening is that this is part of the same trend of your your uh, your technology becoming more like a sahayak in the sense that it's become a, an intellectual aid of a kind that is uh, more quote intelligent unquote than your uh, previous tools now like most technology it's like a it's like a, 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 a sharp knife in your hands right you can cut vegetables with it or you can kill people with it and you can do good with it you can do bad with it so it's not the tool which is uh, which which creates issues it's the power of technology to more um, more revolutionarily uh, change the world in a way that we've never seen before. A simple thing, like for instance, um, okay, I've been saying for the last uh, decade or so that you know AI and machine learning means that jobs are going to disappear, all the low-end jobs are going to disappear, and things like that. But I didn't anticipate how fast that would happen. I mean, what's happened over the past year? A lot of companies are laying off. Um, uh, people in droves, right? Technology companies, software companies, you name it. Um, so this is a trend which is going to happen. And uh, it's something that we have to live with. We need not get too alarmed by it because it's, it's possible for people to give doomsday kind of scenarios and all that. But we still have to discover how to live with it. That's not very clear at the moment because it's going to it's going to sort of upset a lot of apple carts. It's going to change a lot of uh, scenarios. Like for instance, simple thing like exams, Chat GP three, uh, Chat GPT three, for instance, right? It could um, pass the bar exam, but it would do as well as the bottom ten percent. And this was last November. Bottom ten percent of the people who were taking the bar exam, it would do as well as that. Chat GPT-4, which has come out, does Alice as well, that's in six months' time, as the top 10% of the bar exam. It cracks the JRE. It does AP chemistry, AP history, AP whatever you like, right? Quite excellently. So um, a colleague of mine who's a database expert at IIT Bombay uh, uh, put his uh, class assignment into Chat GPT-3. And he says that it gave a response um, better than what many of my students would give. So how do we live with this? Do we go back to pencil and paper exam? We uh, <laughs> take the computers out of the class. Um, this is something that uh, we'll have to kind of think about. And, and, and I'm hoping that discussions like this will help us do so. But I, I tend to take the optimistic view on these things. And as our discussions go on, right, I hope that is what might uh, emerge, right? So I'd like to hand the floor back to you. Right. And continue the discussion. Thank you so much for uh, bringing this very interesting idea of technology as a sahayak into this conversation. Uh, because uh, I, I think a major question which we need to address now that we are seeing uh, AI and technology evolve so rapidly is how exactly can technology be used as an instrument to create a synergy with learners rather than a dependence, right? So you, you spoke of how um, this is, the, you know, layoffs are happening and you, you personally prefer not to believe in uh, the doomsday predictions and, and, and you want to talk about how we want to live with it. So that's precisely what I want to talk about. And I, I want to move on to uh, Koshi Ma'am here. Ma'am, uh, you, you are a principal of a very well-known school. And of course you have in your day-to-day -day engagements engaged with learners and also with their experiences of how they are choosing to engage with technology. So talk to us a bit about how exactly you feel that sort of a synergy can be created between learners, their environment, their teachers, and of course, between the engagement which they have with technology at their disposal. What's your experience and what's your take? Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to know, uh, will ChatGPT be able to give us a solution on how to deal with manual scavenging? You know, I mean, the fact that manual scavengers are down the drain and have to get it cleaned. Uh, or should we just talk about, you know, how ChatGPT is getting the examinations at the IIT level all solved? Could we just answer that question? Uh, does it have an answer to that? And can we implement that on a large scale so that we don't have any debts due to manual scavenging? And I think that question, if answered, would sort of tell you exactly what I'm thinking. 
because this whole kind of scenario is based on, you know, Kavi has just said that, you know, it's been a trajectory, we are into technology. What trajectory are we talking about? Where is this trajectory? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the roads are as dirty as ever, people are as mean as ever to each other, and schools are trying to address this issue. Am I bothered about the examinations? No, I'm not, because my children are not wanting to, uh, I mean, I'm not interested in them answering the questions. In case you do not know, Delhi has just put out a huge circular about the number of examinations that schools have to have. Class five and class eight have to do a midterm exam and a final examination. Oh, and in case you forgot, there is four and six and seven, they too will have a midterm and a final. And then if you felt that was not good enough, please put in some unit tests so that altogether children will be sitting down to time written five examinations in a year. Sure, let's give it to chat GPT to solve. And we will have achieved an education that we set out Four, who is the God that we worship? Is it the God of consumerism? Is it the God of technology? I really would like to get an answer to those questions before we move forward, because unless we have an objective to why we have chat GPT and why we are talking about AA, AI, I would not be able to actually contribute very much. So, so now we have a dialectically different perspective here. As ma'am puts it, who is the God that we worship? Is it the God of consumerism? And how exactly does chat GPT? And, and in fact, I, I, I won't say anything on this. I'll, I'll put this back to, before I come to Poojan, I want to put this back to Professor Kavi for a brief response. What do you have to say on this? I know that's a googly, but <laughs> I'll try my best. Okay, so I tell everybody that uh, engineers and technology is good for solving problems. Okay, but we need the humanities, especially historians and English literature graduates to tell us which problems to solve. So I don't think morality should be con uh, uh, confused with, uh, with, with, with uh, technology because they, 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 they occupy distinct areas. Uh, technology is like a tool Morality is like a, a way we choose to engage with the world. Technology is a means to an end, but the end has to be defined by morality. So I would think that they are just two separate things and you can't compare them. Having said that, I've got thoughts on this thing, but uh, what is happening in the world much of the time is basically something which has been happening, happening since the beginning of time, which is a struggle for power. And the, and the people with power, they tend to subjugate the people who are less powerful, number one. That seems to be the uh, way the world works. And we are faced with this issue that you have all this technology around you, you can either master it and make sense of it, or you can try and shun it and be like a kind of Luddite and say that, look, I've got other things to do with my life than learn this technology. So I'd like to <laughs> pass it back to you, Annie, in the sense that I feel that they're two different issues. And let's not mix the two. And the fact is that GPT and technology is here to stay. It's not going to answer the question of, of, of how will we remove uh, uh, manual scavenging and so on. But there's a good chance that if you put in a question, it will give you about five different ways to do it. And then we have to decide which is the right way for us. That it, it won't do that. Chat GPT is not moral. All it does is that it's absorbed a large corpus of stuff, right? And then it will tell you, it will give you a response based on historically what is the way that manual scavenging has been solved but then we have to figure out how to actually make it happen right and for that i've been i've been uh, uh, shouting out on uh, public um, uh, uh, fora that we need this is a lacuna which we have in our education system we need to we need to um, uh, inculcate much more things like uh, you know Give, give the value of passion. A person should discover their passion in their school or college days. The other thing is 
compassion. We need to develop more compassion in human beings. That's where chat GPT can't help. And that's where an Annie Koshi, the principal of a school and fairly influential with her brood at least, can inculcate those kind of things so they can go out in the world and do great things with chat GPT and technology. Right? The world will not teach them how to do that. That is our job as educators. So that that's that's very well put. And what I want to pluck out from that is the idea of technology as a means and morality as the instrument which decides the end. And now that's where I want to bring in Poojan, right? So uh, Poojan, Professor Arya said something, I think, which is very important in this discussion, which is that we do still need uh, the writers and the literature experts and the historians of the world to decide which questions need to be addressed, right? And that's where I want to bring in the idea of how uh, technology is changing, how we engage with um, the very notion of creativity. Right. So AI has brought in actual machine learning. You had I, I gave the example of DALI and uh, ChatGPT. The mandate of technology has moved beyond mere regurgitation to creativity, to create, to, to to actual creation, and that's what ChatGPT is doing. Even if it's doing something as mundane as um, charting out a poem for a lover. So I want I want your understanding of this change in how we engage with AI. Perhaps do we need to change our own understanding of creativity altogether? Um, perhaps you can talk to us a bit about generative AI and how you use it in your music and this untapped power of creation and how our, uh, our, our changing conception of technology and our changing engagement with technology is shaping uh, that understanding. Over to you, Pooja. Thanks, Arman. Um, yeah, this is, this is something that, first of all, I'm so glad that this is how the panel has been uh, designed and the the range of ideas that we can get from here and that's a very interesting uh thing that uh, dr arya and even uh koshibam had put about how uh like what are the questions that you ask and while we were having the discussion about uh can chat gpt give me the solution to manual scavenging i did just uh, go to a new window ask chat gpt is there a, can you give me a solution to manual scavenging in india and obviously, like Dr. Arya said, it gives us a few uh, a few startups that have been trying uh, technological uh, uh, some some technological uh, uh, maneuvers to go about it. Some laws that have been put up lately, which prohibit manual scavenging, but still, as we know, like it keeps happening. Uh, the idea is that um, we still have the like it's it's very important for us. Um, even as people in education, I, I, us are some stakeholder in education, uh, to have the steering in our hands. And that's something that we have to really look at. Um, as an educator, uh, we I do have at times students coming up to me in confidence and saying that, okay, uh, I had a project that I had to turn up after two days. And all that I had to do is that I had to type in the topic of the project. And it gave me a 2000 word project that had to be turned up on a specific topic. But the decision of what that topic is, the decision of what kind of project I want the student to research on and learn about is still in our hands. And, and that idea, that idea of the information is readily available. And I mean, I don't, um, I, I mean, I, uh, there is a very clear connection here. Koshi ma'am used to be my principal when I was in school. So this is, this is something that I remember very distinctly. I don't know, Koshi ma'am, if you remember this or not. When this was, this would be about 12, 13 years ago when Koshi ma'am said in one of the meetings, and this was that time, this is I think 2010 or 2009, where she said that the content is available on the internet. We don't really have to, we don't really need to talk about the content in the classrooms. And that's precisely what ChatGPT has done, right? The content is there. ChatGPT is just a snapshot of the internet taken at the time of 2021. And that snapshot is something that we're getting access to and it's giving us easy access to that snapshot and that's all that it is we've been over romanticizing chat gpt for maybe can it you know can can it turn against us can it be the destruction of uh, humankind can it turn into one of those uh, isaac asimov stories and uh, is that going to be the next thing I, it's not it'd be giving it too much credit there it's a snapshot of the internet we can use it as a snapshot of the internet and similarly with DALI, similarly with things like, um, you know, there's a lot of AI generated music that's coming out. 
there was this channel um, that would make AI generated music and uh, it was turned down because then it realized so it it created a rendition of a masterpiece by some other musician in the style of the rapper Drake. So Drake had uh, filed a copyright case against the channel and the channel had to put it down because is it original? Is it an original idea? If you create an AI generated idea based on someone else's creative uh, style. So all of that is something that we are still really delving into. We're still really realizing and just creating something from a snapshot of the internet is maybe not the most original thing that there is. So, yeah, I mean, the crux of it is, I think we're giving too much um, credit to chat GPT when we start thinking about, is it going to be the end of an era? Is it going to be the, you know, is it going to be something that will turn out to be harmful to humans? That's, that's I think, something that we probably should uh yeah i'm glad we're discussing more about it yeah right thank you Poojan. and i think this is that you've, you've raised a very interesting point which is that the steering is still in the hands of educators and that it's just a snapshot of the internet i think uh, there was a recent article by, i think it was noam chomsky who spoke of how uh, the crux of machine learning is description and prediction it cannot posit any causal mechanisms or physical laws so uh now, now, I want to come back to Koshi, ma'am. And ma'am, um, the fact is that, like Pujan highlighted, that there are still limitations to chat GPT. We often over-romanticize it. And I think uh, he's got a very fair point there. But the fact is that students who, you're going to, who, who, who are going to come in your institutions, they're still going to use chat GPT. They're still going to use it to draft an essay, which might actually, instead of augmenting their learning, end up substituting their learning. So you can't really, because it's because the incentives within the education system are oriented that way. So if the priority, uh, you, you've pointed out how there are hurdle, there are so many exams, in, and I believe you spoke of class eight, and if the priority is to pass an exam, why will learners, it, it's inevitable that they'll engage with technology, but why will they want to engage with technology in a way that augments and doesn't substitute their learning? And as an addition, how would do you, as people who are stakeholders in these institutions, in, in, in educational institutions, uh, propose to deal with it? Uh, if uh, one, I just want to say that, you know, semantics is a great thing to, uh, I don't think manual scavenging is morality by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. So, I mean, we're not talking about morality and technology, really practicality. Now, uh, just to get our focus correct, I'm not running down AI or I'm not running down chat GPT. I'm just trying to find out that, you know, I mean, this whole discussion about what role does it play and how does it actually get into schools? Now, tell me, for technology to improve the first few decades of a child's life, it has to be able to solve the problems being faced by children today. And what are the problems? Less time for pre free play, excessive curricular, not teachers not up to high standard, you know, less time to ponder and think. Now, if you are saying this, how do I get on? How do I get somebody to love me? How do I get, get to deal with myself and my issues? How do I get to the top, you know, uh, a 1%? So yes, chat GPT or whatever, AI may be able to help in get, you know, helping people who teachers are not built to a particular standard. Again, here, I'm not talking of class one. I'm talking of maybe 12 trying to sit for a board examination. Yeah, sure. You may be able to get a teacher of a higher standard and to say, but can it deal with this whole less time for free, free play and thinking? No. I mean, you want me to deal with a machine that will tell me to deal with an algorithm with minimal guidance. So don't think, but I want to teach children to think. We want, are we going to have people who are actually, you know, uh, stuck accepting the world as it is, or are they going to change the world? You know, are they going to move from conventional wisdom and create new wisdom, or are they not? And since we know that actually the way chat GPT works is actually to sort of pull into the kind of data that has been, if I'm not wrong, been actually programmed in. So then what's new in the world? And I want children who can be creating something new. 
Why will I ask a stupid question in an examination which chat GPT can answer? I mean, that's my problem. I'm the one who's stupid here. And I'm not going to ask that kind of question because that's not what I want you to answer. So, you know, this, what is education for? I mean, what is education for in class one when you're six years? What is education for when you're four years? What is education for when you are, you know, 14, 15, adolescents? You know, at that point, what is going to do? I mean, can chat GPT actually help the government to make a curriculum that is more, you know, focused and scattered the way it is? And why don't they use it for that? That's something that people, so-called people interested in education can do. But to come into class where the whole focus is on the personality development, the character development, the development of thinking, of creativity, of communication. I mean, how do I actually, you know, run down, a, what's it? Uh, what are these um, cow slaughterers, whatever they are, you know, you sort of meet them and no, I'm not going to use my mouth. I'm not going to use anything. I'm going to hit and, you know, uh, kill somebody. Is chat GPT helping in that kind of a society? So as educators, we are visionaries. What is the vision of a society that I want is a question that needs to be answered if I want to talk about education and how technology plays. So yes, not all teachers are built to a high standard. I can use technology for that. Yes, technology can help me to do attendance, can help me to do marking if necessary, can help me to create a curriculum. All the kind of menial tasks, please notice, menial tasks that doesn't require me to have feelings and a brain can actually be dealt by technology. But school, when they all come together, and when we say that you learn more on the playground than in a classroom, then where does technology play a role is a question. So if we, you know, if you're going to say, yeah, where is technology? There is a lot of use for technology. Did radios replace teachers? Did television replace teachers? They were all supposed to replace teachers and they were supposed to really do something to education. Where did we go with that? Thank you, ma'am. Beautiful. <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to respond to any. Anyway, uh, sure, 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 sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Respond. Then, I'll, Annie, I'll, I'll come back. Sure. Just... Annie, you said something really wonderful in, in that you answered all the questions you posed to us. You you said that technology is a menial help, and you're absolutely right. It's a more intelligent. It's instead of a class four pass, my peon is now a graduate, maybe even a postgraduate, but he's helped basically, right? So that's all that's happened, number one. And I think let us change the focus of this uh, discussion uh, to make it more appropriate. So this is not a debate about technology and uh, the effect and damage that it does. I think a nice way to spin this uh, discussion would be that I want to create these qualities in my young people. I want them, as you said, to have character, to have personality, to have, have team, team working skills, right? I want them to have empathy and compassion. I want them to be more aware of the world around them. Okay. Let's say that those are the qualities that we want to, to, uh, to inculcate in kids. And let's see how technology can help that. So perhaps I can give a couple of examples of my own experience. So we are running a project out of IIT Bombay called E-Yantra, which started originally as a project to train uh, undergraduate students in, in uh, engineering skills, technology skills, skills to build machines to solve problems and things like that. What started as an exercise in training them in skills soon became much more than that. We realized that what we want to create is we want to create individuals in society who can use these skills to solve societal problems, right? So that's what we want. And to solve societal problems, you need to have a heart. You need to have compassion. You need to take responsibility for the world. And you need to sort of engage with society to solve problems which exist. So we've been running this project and we've been training students through competitions which last six months long. We train them in these skills. And then we have another competition where 
where we help them articulate interesting problems to solve in society, and then we help them engineer a solution to it. For instance, it's interesting that you talk about manual scavenging because one startup that came out of this initiative from a from, um, bunch of kids in Reva University in Bangalore was a sewer cleaning robot, right? His, his idea was that manual scavenging is, is, is really sad. We need to get over it. And can we use technology to do so? So that compassion, that feeling, that belief, and this empowerment that we gave them, right? Made them come up with a solution. And now he's actually got a startup which is working. He's doing sewer cleaning robots. He's doing pipe cleaning robots and what have you. We have another company, for instance, a startup with our students, which is Rymo Rehab. What it does is rehabilitation equipment for people who need uh, physiotherapy and things like that. So you're right. Um, what we need to do is we need to create these individuals who are empowered to solve problems in society. Now, we've tried doing this with, with, um, with school children. And we've had amazing results in the sense that uh, the same way we train train undergraduate students in robotics, we tried it with some schools, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th standard kids, because that's when they have a little bit more time than earlier or later. And uh, first, we ran a robotics competition in a simulator. They did beautifully, and they called it a COVID stress buster. In fact, a number of the kids said that, you know, maths and physics didn't make sense to me, geometry and all that. But now that I'm solving a real problem, right, I think it's pretty interesting. So I'm motivating them to learn maths and physics. And then I was um, also addressing, uh, I had the privilege of being part of a panel where I was addressing about 6,000 uh, CBSE school principals. And uh, it was on the gamification of education. And there, the, uh, uh, the, the host who was a very interesting lady called uh, Nishi Varma from uh, Sindhya Kanya Vidyale in Gwalior. She was a student of history. So I thought, can we do something with history and technology? Right? And uh, in Olin College, incidentally, which is an engineering college in the US, all the engineering subjects are optional. Only two subjects are compulsory. One of them is history, and the other is English literature. History trains you in critical thinking, which is actually a need of the hour, right? What does a historian do? A historian sees evidence of various grades, reliable, unreliable, visual artifacts, and then tries to piece together what is actually the truth which might have happened. What does an uh, what does a IAS officer do when they have a Pradhan Mantri Yojana, which is being deployed? They have to see what is the effect of this thing. Is the benefit going to the right people? How can I improve it? And so on. Critical thinking skills. What does an entrepreneur do? An entrepreneur is trying to push a solution into the marketplace. So they need to see, first of all, whether the market needs it, right? And if it needs it, how can I detect how much it needs it and what can I give it and things like that. So critical thinking skills. So I'm saying that technology will not help you with these things. These are things that you have to use technology for to animate and make this whole process of learning more interesting, right? So I would again say exactly like you said that technology is good for menial tasks. It's just that my assistant is more, is more intelligent now. So I have to presume that all my kids have a Jeeves, right? Uh, from uh, PG Woodhouse, a very smart butler right, who can help this guy with lots of <laughs> things. So, but but I still have to take the young man and kind of a young woman and, and, and mold them in a way that, you know, technology empowers them to make more of the world than they might have otherwise, right? But the fact is that we have to creatively engage with both them and help them engage with the world to make them the kind of people that we uh, want. And technology is, 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 is an assistant in the process, like for instance, in the history project, what we did is that we trained students in photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is taking lots of photographs with your mobile phone of an artifact. So they take pictures of this artifact, which has historical value. And then we say, let's make a virtual museum exhibit. So they, 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 uh, we teach them to use this 3D software called Blender and they make a virtual museum exhibit. And in the process, what they've done is that we teach them research methodology, how to do research, just because auntie and uncle says something, you don't have to believe them. You have to cite the source. So we are disciplining them, training them in research. And then they have to tell us a story about this artifact such that it maps into your curriculum. And it's a wow story. 
and you tell us what else is happening in the world around you so what i'm saying is as as teachers these these tools are forcing us to be more intelligent ourselves more creative ourselves in the way we deal with technology because the old way of teaching you know here's the book i'm going to regurgitate it to you and then you regurgitate it in the exam that kind of teaching won't work anymore i suspect okay right. i'll just rest my case here thank you uh, professor arya and i think um what we've got is a kind of a combination of two dialectically different understandings of how to use education how to use technology uh, in education and like mam Ko koshi mam spoke to us about how um technology can't teach students how to think it can give them information it can give them knowledge but it can't teach them how to think and she talks very saliently about the need for a certain vision of society a vision of society and that's when professor ara comes in and speaks of the fact that you sure you can have a vision of society but you you can use tech to gear it towards that vision to gear your learners to gear your students towards that vision that's why he spoke of e yantra and he spoke of how he can combine uh, he he has tried to combine the social personality component which uh, koshi mam has spoken about through the use of technology to try and create better citizens by augmenting their learning and now before we come to the q and a this is this is something i want to put to pujan uh, pujan talk to us about uh, talk to us a bit about how um this particular paradigm which professor arya talks about how has that been useful uh, in a field which is not particularly academic which is perhaps course scholastic like your music and 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 how do you as an educator think that that what 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 do you as an educator think could be the future potential of that over to you thanks aman um, one thing that i was uh, i just realized is that something uh which even both uh, dr arya and um, dr koshi said that about how we have been looking at um the way that that technology was it was always said like for example when when uh, the spoke the the telephone word came along when when it said that we can talk to each other through different through from a big distance it was thought of that the written world will go extinct no one will write to each other no everyone will just talk to each other and that didn't really happen maybe it took a different shape maybe not a lot of people hand write to each other and communicate but we talk in a different way and write in a different way uh, similarly for example when pho photographs came along it was said that the paintings will go extinct but that didn't really happen paintings took a different turn so it's maybe maybe whenever we're talking about how ai coming along might make teachers extinct i don't think so uh might change the way that we look at things for example when we started working with um when we started working on when the when the pandemic struck us and we were working with some online examinations um earlier i i don't think uh, like as educator personally we would we would never really google the questions to see what answers show up now what we started doing with our question papers we would google proof them so we would look at every question in the question paper we would google it we would see okay what is the answer is there an answer for this question that's showing up on google do they readily get an answer if that isn't then we reframe it we design it in a different way so we try and make the question google proof so maybe one thing that educators need to do is be ai proof the question papers now or ai proof the assignments that go to uh, the students and all that i'm trying to say here is that we will have to accept the reality of the fact that ai and chat gpt and all of these things are here and um knowing what is here will help us design our ways of interaction personally the menial task that we've been talking about i would love to not spend the time uh, that i spend in trying to form an email to not sound passive aggressive and to choose the right words and if if an ai is trying and doing that for me to make a formal email not sound the way that i don't want it to sound i am glad it's doing that because i i i would want more time to spend on the emotional social spiritual wellbeing uh, and development of the student rather than uh, thinking about the the you know the how do i make this table for the grading part of it how do i you know how do i uh, what is the flow of the uh, the document that i'm creating and things like that with music also we've been thinking about how i we always have a lot of musicians talking about how music will go extinct and this is something that even came up with when electronically developed music started coming along when people started creating sounds 
through the computer and they said now live music will go extinct no one will really listen to live music everyone will listen to recorded music or the music uh, developed electronically that didn't really happen uh, what really helps is that electronically developed music at times makes you uh, like gives you the power of being a solo musician and a diy musician at times like for me uh, i do not know how to play the drums i do not know how to play uh you know i don't know how to play a number of instruments a violin but a computer can help me replicate that sound and then eventually create that experience but even so then we're always trying to cheat the audience in making them believe that this is actually a real violin it's not a computer generated violin if it's a perfect note on if and this is something that you'll notice if i play a perfect perfectly placed keyboard for you on the computer which is com- created by the computer you will never listen to it again so whenever someone is designing a piano piece on the computer you have to put imperfections on it you have to humanize it and that's something that we are that we cannot deny that we as humans when we're looking at an art a transcendental experience we are looking at it being more human if it's too computerized you you i mean i i know a lot of us who's who are in this webinar or part of the audience on the panel you get really uh, irritated when you can realize that this sound is really auto tuned when you listen to a musician when you listen to a singer and you realize this is an auto tuned vocal and you say no i don't want to listen to this audio because you want you want it's it's brilliant it sounds brilliant it's pitch perfect every pitch is struck at the right note but you don't want that that's what auto tune is auto tune is every pitch at the right note at the right time without any imperfections humanizing it is having those character blemishes those variations that you put in it so i um i don't see the fear that a lot of artists see with dali and a lot of ai generated music and art that um art is very human art is something that remains very human if the purpose of your art is to um get more likes on your instagram page if the purpose of your art is to um give across a message in a poster then maybe you're using ai for that but then again those are the menial tasks if the purpose of your art is to give a transcendental experience is to if there is a purpose which is bigger than the immediate gratification of likes and shares uh then ai generated art is not going to do that for you i think thanks thanks pujan for a very um holistic perspective uh, i i think you've 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 done something very important by pointing out to us that revolutions have come in history and uh, most of the times uh, things which they've performed the same function as have not become remnants of the distant past uh, we've learned how to live with them and we've learned how to adapt them to our uh, sort of day to day lives and i think that's a that's a very uh, interesting note to sort of move on to the q and a upon and um, so so uh, we do have some questions which have come in from the chat Uh, and and the first question is one which i'd want to put to koshi ma'am uh, because i do know that um, something which she knows a lot about is this idea of the digital divide and how we can strive towards making access to technology much more inclusive so this question is how do you see the role of education in helping young adults grow into citizens who bring the coherence between morality and ethics and technology and to this of course i want i i want you to answer this within the broad framework of um this this deficiency which we call the digital divide i think that would be particularly enlightening for the audience to know over to you ma'am ma'am may i please request you to unmute yourself yeah so that okay. question uh, is uh, a little out of the area of what we are discussing now you know i mean how do we sort of get people to be um a pride citizens of the countries is i mean is a uh, i think can uh, you know maybe you all should take that as the next topic of discussion uh, rather than this particular one uh it, it i mean there's nothing that can be said in in one sentence or something but uh, talking of technology and citizenship i would say you know i mean that's i think a very very interesting thing and that brings up for instance the internet has been around for 20 years 
we still have board exams. We still have suicide because of exam pressure. We still have children who can't read, write, do basic mathematics. You know, internet has been there for 20 years and we still have people fighting over religion and corruption and humanities, you know, and the most followed personalities in spite of the internet are still athletes, actors, you know, yes, politicians also. So children want to be part of the real world and take joy in the physical world around us. And then where is citizenship in this? I mean, we had talked about morality. And so obviously, unless you say, you know, which is the more, I don't know, it'd be very interesting to see if you ask Chad GPT, what is the moral thing to do in such a situation? What would the answer be in such a situation? Would it have an answer to that? You know, is evil black and goodness white? You know, can you give me a perspective on that kind of thing? Maybe we'll get so, I mean, if you think in terms, I'm, so I'm trying to bring in technology into this idea of citizenship. I mean, if cyber security in an increasingly digitized age makes children easy prey for all kinds of criminals and provides them an environment which is more criminalized than, you know, giving them, because it takes a village to bring up a child. And if the village that we have is the digitized village, is the net which is what happened during in, uh, during COVID and all, that, I mean, children are now, you know, I mean, their, um, their idea of uh, making love is porn. This is what it is, let's have group sex or whatever, because that's what they were saying. So there was no adolescence education at, during the COVID era. You sort of got onto the net and saw how it was to kiss or do whatever it was. And that's what they know. And now when we find, you know, that, children doing something is because seniors tell us but ma'am they never had what we had you know the occasion to discuss anything in class and to find out I mean they ask things like you know I mean if one condom had a hole in it should I use two condoms I mean which chat GPT is going to answer this kind of question you know so I mean that is what citizenship, the empathy of it, the responsibility of citizenship. I mean, when we talk of citizenship in our school, at least, uh, we want you to go out and look at a situation which requires you to be an active, participative citizen. Doesn't require you to go and you know do always do an inquiry, but you should know what is the law. You should know how to deal with people who are supposed to deliver the law. How does one do that in, in a digitized world? You know, this, the environment we are creating for learning and exploring. So I think it's interesting that the people who are actually creating something like uh, the chat GPT are not educators. And then we say, let's do this in education. I mean, I think the only thing that, you know, actually the Inet has done fabulously is to sort of run down the tuition industry because, you know, everybody was having a great, going great guns during Corona time on the net, on the net and all. And suddenly now everybody's stocks are down and they're selling out, right? So, I mean, what happened? What did that actually prove? Why aren't parents stopped going to school and saying, let's just do things online is cheaper. I can be at home. Because, well, children don't grow alone. Why do we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? We have to talk about the developmental needs of children and focus our concentration on that. So, again, I'm saying there is a place for everyone. But the place really is not in the classroom here. It is in, in a different scenario. And uh, I mean, I, I don't think the, uh, the discussion really is on, you know, whether technology can replace education, but I'm, I'm repeating myself here that we need to keep why we are doing what we are doing in mind before we do that. You know, if we can answer that question always, why do I do what I'm doing? Then I'll know how to do it. Thank you, ma'am. And I think uh, this idea of empathy being the bedrock of the interface between citizenship and um, education is, is particularly important to understand here because that question is, is, is very relevant, right? How, how can you trust a bot to be ethical? If, if a being is not social, how can it be ethical? 
right? And there is a major threat of a reflection of human prejudices in AI. So AI is not perfect, right? Chatbots have been known to make things up. Researchers call those quote unquote hallucinations, right? It's, it's basically falsehoods. So if AI can reach the zenith of um, human intelligence on the basis of the sample size that is coded within it, it can also be capable of stooping to the pits of human prejudice. So I think that interface of citizenship and education, the old fashioned way as we know it, is particularly important for our audience to understand. Uh, so I, I wanna move on to the next question here. And, 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 and I wanna put this question to, um, I wanna put this question to uh, Professor Arya because I think we've had uh, Annie Mam's um, take on this or something related to this, to this during the discussion. But I, I, want you, I want your view on this, Professor Arya, because you too are a part of academia. Now, this question goes as follows. We want our teachers to create questions whose answers do not, whose answers do not come from ChatGPT, but our success as schools or teachers or, or colleges and professors is defined by how well students are able to regurgitate content in examinations. Are we willing to change the parameters that define the success of educational institutions? And if I may add a slight corollary to that, uh, how, how exactly can that framework be created? Over to you, sir. Okay. So I take it you're asking me as to um, how can we change the way we look at education and how can we define what the outcome of education should be and let that guide everything. Is that correct? Precisely, right. And, we basically change the incentives right, which guide the system. Right. How do we do that and yeah. how should we? So basically, I can have in my mind a model that every child comes with a little butler who is very intelligent and can go away and do all the Godagiri stuff and finding out information and all that kind of stuff and give it to them in the hand to give to the teacher. Now, I need to now be different in the way I engage with my kids. I need to pose them stuff and questions that cannot be answered on Google as, uh, as Poojan said. And I find that we've been intuitively doing this in the competitions that we run. Like uh, we, we, take, uh, uh, we take problems from society and we model it as a game with a very objective uh, scoring criteria. And uh, uh, students have to go and solve that problem. And we leave enough scope in the way we define the problem for there to be many different solutions, right? So it means that we have to be more intelligent in the kind of questions we ask the kids and the kind of problems we pose them. They have to be slightly more open-ended where then you can explore and, and, and let the, the creativity of the students come out in, in the way they address these issues where just chat GPT or a Google help or something is not going to help you. Okay. So we have to pose a question as, and as uh, Pujan said, you have to Google proof the question. Now we, uh, it means we've got to change our mindset. That means a big burden is there on the teachers. They cannot ask students what is there in the textbook, which is what we do, which as you've realized is a very failed way of educating people, right? Because we are trying to get them to do what computers ought to be doing. We need to in engage kids in discourse. We need to encourage a curiosity we need to encourage a self-learning ability. We need to encourage them to ask questions. And we should not say, shut up. You shouldn't ask, answer. I'm the teacher. I'm telling you, and this is right. So we need to, uh, our teachers need to engage with kids differently and, and uh, train them how to ask questions, which is not what as much, I believe, what our education system is doing at the moment graduate or whatever it is. That's why when we take them into higher education, like research and things like that, they, do, they don't do very well because they've not been encouraged to ask questions. They've not been encouraged to question the status quo. And I will argue with you that in order for a person to be a good citizen, they have to know how to ask questions. They have to question whatever is happening around there. They need to critically think about all the rubbish which is being fed to them on, on, on uh, the fake news and media and stuff like that and question it and use websites to validate whether something is true or not. So this critical thinking, I think, is something that needs to be developed more. So I feel that the emphasis of our education needs to change. It cannot remain the way it is passing exams based on whatever is there in the textbook. Now, our education system is not going to cha change overnight. So how do we deal with this? 
okay your teachers are not going to change overnight it's not a profession in which you pay them as much as they pay you in the software industry or the fintech industry or whether you can sit at home and make lots of money through giving tuitions and stuff like that so how do you get that kind of talent into the industry is the real question also finland incidentally the highest paid profession in finland is teachers right in bhutan the highest paid paid the profession is teachers i think that's the kind of systemic change that we need in society that we need to have really cool people there who can you know set the example teach by example ask the right questions encourage kids to ask questions be courageous enough to say i don't know let's find out you know those kind of things and only then can we get a citizen because as a citizen i would like someone intelligent with scholarship who asks questions and doesn't accept a status quo until they are convinced that that um, uh, it's cool so have i answered the question that you wanted i i think i i, I don't really think there is a perfect answer to that question but i think you've uh, made a rather valiant attempt because uh, google proofing a question and um, the importance of questioning the status quo teaching kids teaching students teaching learners how to question um is 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 a particularly important characteristic which in many ways is is germane to the experience of education um i i don't think anyone would really be educated they can be literate but they can really not be called educated unless they know how to question and i think that's a very important point which we need to bring in here and i and this next question is one i want to i want to divert this to um to poojan because um even as an educator poojan you're relatively young so i i i would presume um and perhaps this is a blanket presumption but i would presume that um you you closer to your students in terms of how they feel emotionally they can perhaps connect to you more because you're closer to their sort of age group and and that's why i want to put this question to you um how and when do you think we should introduce technology to our students so that they develop comfortably and morally with this technology is it possible to use ai to actually teach compassion and empathy to children and the example which the questioner has given is that there are now apps which help children identify their emotions could this be used in our classrooms to empower both children and educators over to you thanks arman uh, firstly i'm not that young i just choose a lot of skin care products so maybe that's what is uh, <laughs> well then it's a compliment either way <laughs> jokes apart yeah that's that's true a lot of students end up uh, communicating with a age group of teachers that are closer to their age and the age gap doesn't really uh, uh, make them feel that there's a generation gap and people like me who can make pop culture references to them when we're discussing concepts and uh, you know uh, various ideas and the the um, the time when uh, technology is uh, then the student or the the child is being exposed to technology i think it's not in the hands of the school anymore like i remember when i was in school i was introduced to technology through the school the computer lab would be the place where you sit down and there's the excitement of opening your first email id and that all of those things were the first thing that you get exposed to technology with but um, students come well versed with technology as soon as you you see a lot of you see toddlers not eating food without a phone in their hand uh, ever since they learn the basic motor skills so i think that that scaffolding is something that has become very personal for caregivers as soon as they become caregivers and that's something that is um, that has that is that is becoming a decision of the people who are the first caregivers for a child uh, in terms of school even um even in education again the idea of providing access to technology i think there is there is a um, a deeper discussion on what technology do they get the access to do a does a grade 2 student get the access to a chat gpt i am not so sure if they will be able to make the best use of it but does a grade 2 student get the access of let's say uh, a vr glasses or a grade 3 student gets access to a virtual reality glass and if they want to look at the solar system through it which they cannot uh, in literal life and if they if it helps them to get spatial uh, recognition of a three dimensional space if they want to understand the cube and actually get into the cube and see how the diagonal is formed things like that yes maybe that is uh, one space so 
access to the whole arsenal of technology maybe uh, that like koshi ma'am said maybe for a grade 11 12 when we are sitting down we are giving them this is the whole access you want any content any concept that you want to study you have the whole access you study from it but the scaffolding has to be layered is what i feel with the emotional well being of the students and the the children of today i think um it can be a good starter there like you know i mean we've all gone through those disasters where we're feeling uh, some symptom of any kind of un, uh, not of any kind of illness and we search the internet and the internet has the most disastrous results for us that any headache can turn out to be the most serious illness that you have so searching for symptoms and asking the internet and asking it for the symptoms might not be the best way for us to tackle um Uh, well being of any kind but yes it gets it's, it's probably a very nice starter it's a very nice uh, way of initially realizing at what level do i want the human intervention there are a lot of people who work in the sector of well being and therapy and psychotherapy who the initial mundane part of it where they have to do the data collection where they have to understand the the nitty gritties of the the basic structure of what is needed and what kind of intervention is required can be a good uh, place for ai and technology to be in but um, human well being without humans would again i think like the therapists and psychotherapists and the people working in mental well being are again safe and secure with their jobs they are extremely important and that's not something that ai is taking away thank you thank you so much for that pujan and um, and we're almost out of time here so uh, and and i think we're done with the questions too um i for the audience i think we've had a very diverse corpus of perspectives on technology uh, on how we consume technology and how we choose to engage with it and i think um before uh, this this webinar i i i my my basic rationale here was not to not for the audience to go away with a very uh, positive rosy eyed perception of what technology is going to do to education and to learning neither did i want them to go, go away with the doomsday prediction of technology replacing all sort of human potential um i i wanted this to be a discussion whereby it's up to the audience to really make sense of it to make sense of where exactly Uh, the role of technology in education is going to be placed how um educational institutions and how learners and teachers and ped pedagogy in general is is going to orient uh, technology and and incorporate it and i think so we've had we've had in professor arya uh, an optimist we've had in uh, koshi ma'am a pragmatist and in in pujan i think we, we i i can best describe pujan as an experimental consumer of technology because he's been experimenting with all sorts of things and and he's had, he's given us some very interesting experiences which he's had so um what we've really um come to at, at the end of this discussion is that any realistic appraisal of the projection of technology in education must account for how these bots and and these these models of technology can only respond to inputs unless we type in our grouse and uh, no bot can know what interrogation to undertake more importantly without a code that lends a bot to undertaking this particular analysis we will not even have a bot so even if we do have a bot for uh, the plethora of things which we've discussed um a human creative potential is not going to be thwarted it's only going to be redirected and the only example which comes to my mind at this point of time is how um ai is be beautifully being used in a kind of a synergy in uh, in medicine so there is this bot called alpha fold which can predict the sequence of every protein known to science and it's potentially opening the door to increasing efficiency and reducing what earlier costed millions of dollars so that is the kind of coexistence which we need to extrapolate to education we need to foster a kind of synergy between learners and between technology and we need to make sure that that synergy make sure that that, that those students those learners are developing scholastically co scholastically their personality development isn't hampered and i think that is something that is an onus which we have as educators uh, and and also as of course stakeholders in society 
So I think the future of technology in education uh, looks very promising. There are going to be hurdles. There are going to be hindrances. We must not, I think one thing which we've learned today is we must not overstate uh, how advanced these bots have become. Um, there's still a long way to go, but we're also developing quite rapidly. So we're going to be there in, 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 in a comparatively short period of time. So um, I do think we've had a very comprehensive discussion here and I'm very thankful uh, for being a part of this. Uh, and I hope that the, what the audience takes away today is also an equally comprehensive and holistic perspective and an understanding of how um, the engagement with technology can best be fostered through human potential. And uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll sort of sign off and uh, may I please hand over the stage to Poojan for uh, concluding today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Arman. I think I, I say this on the behalf of everyone who's a part of this webinar. Uh, thank you to the panelists, the moderator, that this has been really engaging and thought-provoking for all of us, uh, including being a part of this conversation. Uh, I generally have, it has put me into a lot of thought, and the major thought of it is that um, maybe if the direction that we had taken for education and life uh, a number of times we would get distracted and try to become machines and try to make humans into machines. And uh, and now machines have come along and they're challenging us. How can you be a better machine than us? And that's something that we have to really start thinking about. Um, and the major, major thing that we start to delve upon uh, and which becomes some a point of introspection for, a, for all of us is that then what makes us more human? What makes us human? And, uh, and that is... And another thing that comes out of it is that uh, what is the purpose of anything that we are doing? Are we doing something just for the sake of it or are we thinking of the purpose of what we are doing it for? Uh, as someone um, in uh, who, who, who takes a lot of interest in mathematics and technology, um, a number of times, a lot of these things that happen in mathematics and technology just happen, are just done by mathematicians because, okay, let's see if we can do this and they do it. And then Later on, people figure out, okay, we can do something about it. For example, uh, Fourier uh, created the idea of a Fourier transform. Fourier did not really think of this is what it will be used for. He just started off and realized, okay, I can do something very cool with this and I can change the sine wave into a step wave. And that is how initially later on, after years and years of when he created the Fourier transform, we have digital technology and things analog could get converted to digital using that but he didn't think of it so while developing a number of things i think we at times do not really know what are we sitting on the seed of and what that seed turns out to be and um i would really like i would really like uh the panelist dr arya dr koshi dr arya do you want uh to conclude any last thoughts any few words that you would want to add Yes, in fact, I've been wanting to tell you guys a story. Um, we had a very distinguished <clears throat> head of department at uh, Oxford when I was doing my degree there. His name was Professor Tony Hoare. He's one of the, as we say, uh, great men of computer science, a Turing Award winner and so on. And this was in the early 80s. And when AI and machine learning was just kind of in its nascency at that time, and people were saying that it can do that, it can replace humans and this and that and the other. And uh, he suggested that AI is a bit of a red herring in the sense that there are certain things which are uh, quintessentially human, which can't be done by computers. And I think the realm of uh, creativity, that means creating something totally new, right, is not there in computers. Computers will let you access a large corpus of knowledge and answer questions on it and show you how things have been done before. But creating new knowledge is something which is a very human thing. And he gave an example. He said a student came to me with a question based on some coursework that he had been given. And I sat him down and I explained to him uh, the whole idea and the concept and stuff like that. And uh, I asked him whether he understood. And he said, yes, sir, I did. And then he walked out of my room. Pro Professor Hoare then said, it's the way he closed the door as he was going out of the room that made me feel that he's not really understood. The way he closed the door made me feel he's not understood. So he called him back and verified that he didn't understand, sat him down, made him understand it. And when he was convinced, he let him go. 
Now, where would a computer tell you that the way a person closes a door informs you of the state of that person's mind? This is something which is very human. These leaps of intuition, leaps of faith come from a different zone. People call it consciousness or what have you. So this is something that has always been in my mind. I just wanted to share this story with you. So this and things like love and empathy and all these things that we call 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 uh, human is something that we need to sort of cultivate more in our education system. And as Pujan quite rightly said, let's not train our kids to be machines, which is what the conventional education system appears to be doing. And maybe we should 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 uh, encourage them to be more engaged with the world and you know try to see how to make the world a better place and let's use everything to see how that can happen ask questions ask uh, uh, and 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 try and engage with the world more 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 uh, creatively for want of a better word i'd just like to leave it at that so i'm saying that that being human means to have love compassion want to sort of do good things to the world i leave the bad things out and to connect and to sort of engage uh, with other human beings. That's very fundamental about us. And machines are just a means to an end. Pujan, does that answer your question? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Arya. Uh, Koshi, ma'am, uh, if you have something to add. Yeah. Um, I think uh, words like human being is very, very important, you know, and uh, we have one planet. We are human beings on the planet. Technology, I mean, if we talk about climate change and we talk about, which are all very important aspects, I'm sure you'll agree, the pollution in Delhi. I mean, what would one say is, you know, really sort of contributing to it are our cars. And, you know, that's where technology comes in, you know. Uh, where what has brought in by technology which will reduce pollution for instance how does how will it help so pollution i mean okay more computers more something some more you know garbage around the place that's that's what's happening so how do we why do we forget that we are human beings why do we forget the needs of human beings so yes, technology is now going to address the fear of parents by having an app or tech in place where it is able to read the emotional situation of each child in real time, can see if a child is focused on the lesson or not. But what happened to the time that parents should spend with their children? I mean, technology helping parents is to do surveillance. I want to be a citizen. That is responsible. Does surveillance teach me responsibility or does it teach me irresponsibility? Does it teach me to be a crook or not a crook? You know, so um, I mean, I'm saying this that very often. So yeah, technology, people are interested in sort of solving certain problems. They go ahead, they solve it, they create new things. But did they create it for education? That's the question. They didn't. They were just, you know, exploring something. There are people who are interested in that kind of thing. They're exploring it. Great. But is it supposed to be for education? You know that. So we want to take, you know, a square peg and put it into a round hole. No, it doesn't work like that. And uh, uh, so I think when I start off with human beings, I do want to say that uh, why do we... Why do we lose focus? I mean, that's so important. What's this, all this meditation and all about is to actually tell you that don't lose focus on where you're going. Where are you going is the question. Do we answer that question? Where do I want to go? And I think that is the question that needs to be answered when we talk about transferring one thing from one place to another. Okay. So, um, yeah, lovely talking to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would really like to thank uh, every team member from the organizing teams of PLS, of CEP, of Fritinjali, and uh, the audience members for posing really thought engaging questions using the chat function pretty well. And um, also, thank you, Arman, for moderating it so well. Uh, Dr. Arya, Dr. Koshi, Arman, 
it's been an honor and it's been a pleasure to be a part of this conversation thank you so much uh, to the audience